The following episode of the Carnival of Randomness is sponsored by an important message to you, the people from Upsitnik and Associates. Every day there are forces that are taking from you, stealing from you. Your money, your time, your freedom. Immense faceless corporations, banks, credit card companies, insurance providers, government agencies, this list goes on and on. When you are under attack and facing crisis, turn to us, Upsitnik and Associates, attorneys for you, the people. When every day becomes a battle, we can advise and assist. We have been advocates for 40 years. Email us through UpsitniksLaw.com or call us at 1-866-391-3299 or reach out to us through Upsitnik and Associates on Facebook for a prompt, no obligation, communication, and consultation. Don't be pushed around. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Carnival of Randomness. And we are on the road now in Middle Earth, and we are looking for Mount Doom to get rid of that ring. Actually, we found not the ring that you're thinking of. We found one in the bottom of a Cracker Jack box. And Zach is playing my Frodo over there. Man, why do I got to be the weird one? But we couldn't find Mount Doom. We couldn't find it anywhere, but we did find Mount Doom. We did find I'm not as scary. I'm not as scary as I think you. I'm supposed to be, but I'm going to throw a banana peel so you slip trying to go up me. So I'm going to stop doing this, and I'm going to try to roll the multi-sided die and find some good 2020 guests. 2020 saving so. throw. We can save this intro. <laughs> so would you like to roll it out? Oh, excellent. Patrick and Mario. Hello. Hello. Hi. Yes. And after that, if you yeah. still want to stay around, yeah, yeah, we, no. uh, we are going to talk about... We're going to talk about Dungeons & Dragons and tabletop role-playing games yep. and uh, how, uh, where they came from, what they are, um, talk about some, uh, some maybe some negative uh, and positive, I guess, stereotypes that come into play when people think about... Um, Doing this thing with my hands, I don't know why. I do um, it too. <laughs> the negative stereotypes that come with people. You didn't who play have to the tell Indian. them you were doing it. <laughs> they would have found out eventually. I think out loud. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's just all about uh, all about nerdy stuff that we do. Um, I'm outing and uh, officially out Mario as a as a as a D and I didn't I, realize. I, I gotta say that uh, like a generation ago, you might have to like black out our faces and like change our voices and stuff. <laughs> it was like, but now apparently it's way cooler. So yeah. uh, than it was. So I for all of the the younger generation that's all excited about actually doing this kind of stuff, I think that's really great because uh, you know. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't always something you would you'd kind of talk about really quietly in the corner of the lunchroom, maybe back in the 1980s. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, think, I think thanks in no small part to podcasts and streaming, um, just just listening to and watching people play a game uh, is is entertainment now, I guess. Oh, it, it's a, it's its own genre. Yeah. These yeah. Days. One of my things was the old Avon Hill catalogs, and they had all these really cool role-playing games. Mm-hmm. And, and I remember my mom trying to get me the Call of Cthulhu game for a Christmas present, and my dad <laughs> said, hearing her call the company trying to pronounce Cthulhu, <laughs> C-H. <laughs> but they had all these, and I always found, because you could just be immersed in these things. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, it the, at the end of the day, I, I, I say it's immersive story, storytelling or interactive storytelling because it's, it's really what you're doing. I, I, now that you mention that, I kind of liken it to like a tabletop version of those old choose-your-own-adventure books. Exactly, yeah. It's like, no, nope, finger was on the page. Doesn't count, doesn't count. <laughs> finger never left the page. You were going to stay in the cave. I remember two of us in grade school, and they had the question, will you stay in the cave overnight or leave right now? And only two of us said, leave right now. Because <laughs> that was the obviously not the answer you're supposed to take into the right answer. Yeah. Because yeah. always you're going to eat my snakes or whatever else. Yep. Mm-hmm. But I really don't even know when these games, I have to admit that, I really don't know when these things first came into popularity. Because I remember when I was a kid, I think that's mm-hmm. when I first. So, yeah. So they all started, um, uh, what what we what we now know as you know, the role-playing games um, started in the in the mid 70s really and it was born out of uh war games uh and these these guys in hobby shops would you know would play war games with with miniature figures and and they would be army versus army um and they'd roll dice and uh you know spend hours of their time just kind of reenacting battles uh either historical battles or or made up stuff and a couple of the a couple of the guys uh, wrote a uh, this guy Gary Gygax and I think Jim Perrin was the other guy who who wrote a game called Chainmail, which was a uh, medieval uh, 
medieval war game, miniatures war game, um, that was more like a small unit tactics. And then, then they boiled it down even smaller to just individuals. What, you know, what if he had a system where an individual guy with a sword and a shield could fight another guy with a sword and a shield? And, uh, and then step further from that as, well, what are they doing when they're not fighting? Maybe they go on adventures or that there's, you know, and maybe instead of basing it on historical stuff, we, we base it on fantasy. And, and it kind of steamrolled and became Dungeons and Dragons, uh, which was the first, you know, the first tabletop role playing TSR? game. Was it TSR? Is that the company? TSR, yeah. Um, it was, that was Gary Gygax and Dave Aronson, who <coughs> both uh, passed away not too long ago. Um, but that, you know, I think the f- first, like, box set of Dungeons & Dragons came out in 74, I believe. January of 74, I yep. actually, it was something that we put up on our social media. I pulled up the post. Yep. Mm-hmm. January of 74, through three three different hand-assembled booklets that were shipped in cardboard boxes, sold out the first thousand in 11 months. Yep. So and back f- in 74. And then television actually had a not very good D&D game, wasn't over near the board gaming yeah they did have one though and and they uh uh, i found this today actually i was just searching online and i found that somebody is selling a third printing first edition wood grain box set jesus god it's uh right now the bid is the starting bid twenty five hundred dollars buy it now price thirty nine ninety five it's only a thousand dollars each guys yes (laughs) together we could have that um and play the very very stripped down dungeons and dragons but um that tells you how you know how uh far back this goes and and how popular it really really is or really was and then they you know it it gained uh, more kind of media preeminence in the early 80s um, and uh, there was you know advertised on television and there was a cartoon um, and then of course the satanic panic um, I actually was uh, was not allowed to play Dungeons and Dragons because my mother who was very religious had heard it was satanic well, I have a friend yeah, you of were mine so many demons demons a friend of yeah, mine could was... watch the Harry Potter read the Harry Potter books to see the movies because they were devils. Yep. The Smurfs yeah. was another one. Yeah, no, the they Smurfs were was a weird one. Well, they were, they were I communist. see. They I mean, they were I can obviously Yeah, there was a weird thing about about the Smurfs, too. Yeah, that's, I guess, yeah, that's her communist. You know, yeah, there's somebody wrote an entire blue. dissertation about the Smurfs being an, uh, an allegory for communism. Good Lord. I read it. It was <laughs> actually well written. I'm sure. <laughs> the Teletubbies. Well, yeah. there was the well they are Satan. Them. Yeah. They are Satan. They're just weird. But... Yeah, it was in, you know, and then and then uh, it was never in fashion. It was always a kind of nerdy thing. Um, I always call it cult things where there's yeah. these little niches where people are into something, this, that. It's not so-called mainstream. It's like a cool little hobby or something. I'm, I'm wondering, mm-hmm. do you think, because of the time it came out, that was right around the time, you know, the late 70s when sci-fi started coming about in the movies. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, Star Wars, Alien... You think that may have contributed to it I, kind of getting pushed a little I more? I think the the uh, the emergence of what we now call nerd culture mm-hmm. was all you know. That's pretty maybe much maybe go it back a little farther to the '60s because that's huge. Uh, Tolkien was Tolkien, huge. Yeah, yeah. Tolkien was huge. Frank Herbert, you know, Dune, oh, all that Frank stuff Herbert. got. And, Stranger uh, I, to Strange Land. There was it because it, it, it appealed. It appealed to the disenfranchised. Yeah. Uh, people and then doing, of course, the drug culture and and I think you go in the seventies. You, know, you have the bad economy. You have Tricky Dick. Yeah, you have Escapism gas lines, which thing. I think I remember, like when I was a kid, vaguely remembering that. You had where we're going to blow the world up with Russia. Oh, and yeah. I think people just wanted to get away from reality a little bit. Yeah, escapism was a huge thing um, back then, and you know, then you had like. In pop culture, you had like Led Zeppelin. How many you know Middle Earth themed? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you know the story stories. that Paul McCartney was hoping to do a Lord of the Rings film with the Beatles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it was going to be John was going to be Gollum, mm-hmm. George was going to be Gandalf, Ringo was going to be Frodo, and Paul was going to be Sam. And that would have been I. That would have been. Great. I did see one of the things I was really keen on when I was a kid because my parents, they really didn't care what I saw and watch, which it was amazing. My but precious. I saw the Bashki Lord of the Rings film. Like yeah. I remember going 
to the Lord of the Rings film at the theater, going mm-hmm. to the wrong theater and seeing Invasion of the Body Snatchers. But then he <laughs> went to it, and it was that old theater down on the ridge that's gone now. But I think what he did, too, is he, he did the animation over people, too. Yeah, they wrote his rotoscope animation, so they just, yeah, they just did, they, they, they filmed people and then and then drew over them, and they so they had that weird realistic quality of movement and it's that's you know that's that's just the very early basis of like motion capture you know yeah. that stuff they do now which is which is the thing so it's there's always been a thing but that was where it was really primed for it to come into being there and i think that it takes the escapism mm-hmm. but also i think one of the things for me is even the books how the details i would like to just read about the characters and the, mm-hmm. the books and everything oh like the dungeon master's guide yeah. <laughs> I, I I've heard that a lot of there's there's a lot of people who you know uh, they they didn't have a group to play with so but they buy the books and just read the books. I, I think even now actually so with the, uh, these adventure path series that come out that people play through it's a storyline that carries characters all the way from uh, their beginnings the first level all the way up to their really powerful characters and it's one big long story with a bunch of characters and events and there are frequently people who post about having read the the path there's a whole conversation about people that haven't played it just people who have read it and are discussing how exciting it is to read the story yeah. uh even if you don't end up playing the story and some people are saying yeah well this one's not that exciting to read but might be pretty fun to play so i mean they're actually critiquing and discussing how fun it is to just read the books um before they even get to the point where they're actually participating and playing any and of them. I think maybe done well a lot of fantasy like that what they do is they create a whole alternative world like Middle Earth or one of those yeah where the, or game Wisteria Wisteros right. which I still don't fucking pronounce it right <laughs> <laughs> but well, that, that's the big part of it is is uh is building a world and populating it with you know people and history and events and 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 guys like Tolkien who who spent so many years creating this world and, and left just endless source material, um, you know, adapts well into this. And there's been, there's a, there's a number of different, you know, RPG it's incarnations. Like, it's of, like, how uh, many Tolkien. languages did that well, guy invent for yeah. his books? Mm-hmm. I toss this one out because I used to watch this TV show, Sliders. You ever, this yep. is where they have, they go into alternative universes, so they're trying to get home. So they end up at this one by the, the character's mom's house, they have 45 seconds or they have to jump again to go in another universe. So, okay, they look around, they say, look at the news. O.G. Simpson arrested? They see all this other stuff. Okay, I don't think we're in the right universe. You know, the Raiders move. <laughs> so imagine popping in now. Donald Trump president? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we should go. Oops. Yeah. T- uh, alternative. Yeah, then there's an alternative history kind of things will play into that too you know you a lot can, of steampunk came out of there too where they yeah a lot of yeah there's a lot of and that's the other thing too is that D D spawned an endless number of other games of varying you know varying popularity um there's there's uh you know even just they when they they broke out um a bunch of other games started. There's, you know, Tunnels and Trolls and Castles and Crusades and you know the games that came up with more original names. Uh, mm-hmm. And then and then TSR, their company, came out with a uh, you know Top Secret, which is a spy game, and Boot this Hill, which was the Western. Was another game. one where you sort of follow these clues. It's almost like a Sherlock Holmes game. Yeah, you, it's it, something well, you got to get started on. It's tough sometimes, but you follow one clue. Mm-hmm. And, and and there there is either as elaborate rule sets or simple rule sets and. You know, at the end of the day, uh, the whole point of it, you know, is it's on one hand, it's a game, but on the other hand, it's kind of a social, uh, a social like team team exercise. It's cooperative. Everybody's kind of working together on a goal. I like the idea that if you play, if you play yeah. a war game, you do this, okay, you have to fight the battle, you're done. This, it keeps going. You can keep yes. evolving, keep going with the story. And I think there's an appeal to it right there. You're not just, okay, okay, we're done tonight, you're dead. I think, yeah, I think an evolution of the game is created also is is helped to to create a a larger audience from a diverse audience because now, you know, as the games have developed further and further, then you pick something that's the type of genre that you're interested in playing. So if you, and and the type of role play that you want to do. 
So there's plenty of strategy, military-style type games, and then there are other games that don't focus so much on the combat portion of it yeah. or focus a lot on different skill sets or different worlds or whatever kind of um, you know alternative reality you want to play in. So I think another you know big contributing factor to maybe getting some people playing who wouldn't necessarily have uh, 20 years ago, for example, would be the fact that there are so many different options now that allow people the chance to... Um, play the kind of game that they're most interested in playing. I think some are interesting too, like the ones now those sim those sim games where you build an empire, you try to rule a country, mm. and not get tossed in the fire, and you have to <laughs> learn how to do. That. I think those are pretty cool. Well, there's or build a railroad. Even there's one like that. There's a there's there's like a lot of there were like distinct periods too um, in in the whole RPG thing, and you know the, initially we had Dungeons and Dragons and fantasy games. And that was more like the 70s. In the 80s, it started to branch out a little. They were, you know, playing around with genres and sci-fi and uh, and and games like Gamma World, post-apocalyptic, Boot Hill, which was a, a western. And then um, in the 90s, the games got edgier, mm-hmm. and uh, and they kind of broke away from the kind of you know combat-oriented kind of kind of uh, uh, structures like of, of Dungeons and Dragons and stuff. And then you had games like Vampire the Masquerade, which was the big kind of breakout of that period where it that became... That was so 90s, really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you had, you had games like 90s. Cyberpunk, Shadowrun, uh, uh, Vampire the Masquerade, Dark Conspiracy, and these games where there was, you know, there was fighting in them, but then there was there was interpersonal conflict, too. Like, you, instead of having this merry band of adventurers who are all you know, going through the same thing, you might have a group of people who might not necessarily see eye to eye on everything and have to deal with their own, you know, kind of, you know, it's like, I'm this kind of vampire, you're that kind of vampire, they're different, they don't get along, or, mm-hmm. you know, and they're more, and they're, those are more based on social climbing and power games and, uh, you know, kind of divvying up your city and, and then Man, also never, trying to... I never heard of any of those ones. The, those, I, yeah. I've heard of them. I've heard those of games them. actually introduced also this kind of idea of this morality sort of to the game in the respect that the decisions that you make and things that happen in them, there's a lot of uh, the there's a lot of consequence and a lot of discussion of, like, an action affects the rest of the game in more than just, okay, yeah. now that monster's going to come back to kill you later. But really the idea that you played a lot of characters that had both statistically and just in the workings of the interactions of the game, decisions they're making are determining who they become as people. And so, you know, there was a lot of this idea of, um, I guess that happens, you can see that more in TV and movies too, right? Obviously, in the, we didn't necessarily have a film that dug deep into, like, the character arcs or the anti-hero or that kind of well, stuff. Well, there was a Dungeons & Dragons movie. I don't think it was very good. We don't, no, yeah. no yeah. Let's stay away I'm sure they don't that. discuss that. that. I, I, yeah. I liked the cartoon, though. The, yeah. the, cart- the cartoon was was fun, and, and it was trying to reach out to that kind of preteen audience right. that was really getting into the game and, and the aspect of, like, you know, oh, you're becoming this character now. You know, so what do you do? And that's, you know, I mean, if you want to boil role-playing games down into one sentence, it's asking the question, what do you do? Yeah. You know, here, here's here's where you are. Here's what's going on. What do you do? And your decisions are essentially endless. I like the active part of that, too, where you're not just sitting back watching a screen or something. You're actually yeah. Yeah. You're participating. It stimulates the mind. But it's one thing I have to, back in high school in the 80s, my how I, I had a group of friends who were really into this. They used to always break, go about go to SimCon. Yep. But they kept it. Now we have to get the little stereotype people always had. They kept it very quiet at high school. Yeah, are you, it was are you not, coming over like what's yeah? Because it seemed they'd had that stigma about you were that unpopular person. Mm-hmm. You're sitting in your mom's basement with your friends, and and you're well, and you're not. We used to do that. Yeah. Watch David Letterman, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the other thing too. It's just like it's it it, it kind of drifted to the bottom of the nerd hierarchy which yeah. was just like you know guys who collected comic books would still make fun of the guys who played dungeons mm-hmm. and dragons and at the end of the day the jocks are beating up i have both to tell a story up. from empire comic days literally because when they had the cross-gen comics and they had yeah. some of the more fantasy comics and a couple of the comic guys are going glad these people are coming in here now we have people to make fun of <laughs> yeah <laughs> which you know which is that's human nature i guess um, but you know, there, there's, like I said, I, 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 I like to, to talk about the, you know, the, the, the stereotypes 
of, uh, you know, people picture guys sitting around a table dressed in, like, robes mm-hmm. and stuff, which is I've never there was, ever seen. You have to check out this doing that one episode of I, Zombie. Literally, you know the premise where she eats the brain? Oh, yeah. Well, she gets yeah. the dungeon, man. She, she's sitting there, so she's eating the brain. They're trying to figure out how this person got murdered. So she's sitting there at the table. She's the dungeon master. And this full witch, wizard yeah, hand. Which, now we rule. Now you can eat. <laughs> it's, it's just yeah, that is the ultimate stereotype. So oh, that's it's wrong, wrong in so many ways. But, yeah, it's funny. I mean, they just did a thing on, on Saturday Night Live, and people started getting upset. I'm like... You know, we're all silly. I mean, there's, the, you, it, yeah, it's, you know. You're imagining a world in your mind. So, yeah. I mean, like, God forbid. I, I have a f- good friend of mine who, who would say, like, what do you, it's like, well, what do you do on Saturdays? I sit in my friend's basement and pretend I'm an elf. You know, and just <laughs> yeah. like, yeah, it's silly. But at the same time, you know, this, a lot of the stuff you see, you know, uh, people assume that, that everyone is just kind of, you know, it's eating their whole life up. And now, being. Just, I do it's, have to say it's, it's one of those stories, and it really happened that one of my friends, and he had, we went through some times. One of our really good friends passed away, and it was she got murdered, and it was not good for all of us for a long time. But you know, you have to keep living. But with him, he just sort of closed off, and what happened to him? I couldn't get him out anymore because he would play Warcraft, and yeah. he wouldn't he wouldn't stop anymore. And I would call him up just to try mm-hmm. to get him out. And I'm in a major battle. And what happened was we went to dinner one time. I got him out. He got a speeding ticket going home because he was trying to get home so yeah. fast. And you hear about those. I feel like at the beginning of the, around the 2000s or so, for some reason, and I would talk to younger people about this and have conversation and be like, why do you think it's really cool to sit at a computer uh, for hours and hours and, like, blow things up and then communicate with someone? Like, I'm talking to people around the world, right, someone in another country. Mm-hmm. You don't even know who they are. You're not I'm really not, talking, I'm, I'm, not sure why, I'm not sure why that's cool. Yeah, they're and, all talking about and, wanting to have sex with your mother. Right, well, <laughs> yeah, and the whole tabletop gaming thing is somehow not cool. I don't know how... yelling jargon at each other and interspersing it with horrible insults. MLG Pro! It's, yeah, yeah for some reason... 1080 No Scope! I guess but... is you can hide behind it. I don't know if it, like, yeah. the actual it's... contact of looking people in the eyes when you're no, do, it's playing the, a game. It's the... I've never done those, The so telephone tough guy. Yeah. Syndrome. Well, it's yeah. Everybody's you know what it is. It's like okay, like if I talk to you, like say we talk politics, so we we respect we respect each other. But it's so easy to just badmouth the unknown on the internet, like just hide behind that and say, "Well, you're dumb." You're yeah. Yeah. I, I and I yeah I and and I I can't say I'm not guilty of it too. I've done it. Oh, I've done yeah. it too. We've all, you know we all we all and that's the thing. It's very yeah, but easy we're to smart. Do. Our opinions were correct. <laughs> yeah, ours yeah. were smart. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but you know, but with with these games, it's like the, the the thing about it. And this is why before the whole satanic panic thing happened, um, or the people who who ignored it were like you know, moms loved Dungeons and Dragons because they when they knew where their kids were, um, they were reading. They were being social. Using their minds. They were using their minds so they could keep track of, they knew where their kids were, they knew they were doing something that, that wasn't harmful, uh, they knew they were, they were using their brains and doing critical thinking and, and solving problems and, and reading, you know, it just like... Yeah, this game is based on reading books, maybe that's why it wasn't that cool. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> you had to actually read books. But, you know, and and then you t- we talked briefly about the theatrical element, and it's like more and more you're finding you're you're hearing about people in Hollywood mm-hmm. who play D and D. Vin yeah. Diesel, Vin Diesel, big, I was gonna say, yeah. he's the big proponent Vin of Diesel, uh, don't hold that against D and D. Joe Manganiello, uh, 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 Debran Wall. I mean, you know, and then you have the critical role people. They're all voice actors, mm-hmm. and they're all amazing. And they've been doing this stuff for years. A lot, tons of comedians, Patton Oswalt, Brian Posehn. Um, they used you know. to play together, didn't? From what I understand, yeah. So they um, were like podcast it or something. Well, there's a podcast. Brian Posehn has a podcast called Nerd Poker. It's had two incarnations, and and one is called Nerd Poker with Brian Posehn, um, or Brian Posehn's Nerd Poker. Whatever it doesn't matter. It's called Nerd Poker. That's a big thing. Look it up. It's very funny. Uh, it's a bunch of comedians playing D and D. And they started years ago. It was him and Pat Oswald and like Chris Hardwick and those guys. And they didn't record it or anything, but they, you know, the podcast kind of came out of that. Um, and it's literally just, you know, uh, uh, I think it's up to six people now, five or six people now. And they, they sit around his dining room table, play D&D in a, in a, in a campaign that uh, this uh, comic, Dan Telfer, who's a very good comic, check him out. Um, he's the dungeon master. And so he writes everything. He creates a story. And... 
it, there's a lot of bullshitting. You know, it's not a they're, they're not super serious role players. That's another thing about these games too is that there's a million ways to play them. You know, there there are people who just like to roll dice and beat stuff up and don't get into the interaction, and then there's people who like to to just get deep into the psychology and and there's very little fighting and a lot of talking and then there's you know I think we're the groups that Mario and I play in are kind of 50-50. Yeah, we try to um, find the balance. I mean, that's what I like too is that all of the games, I mean, if no you're playing a game it. that is hundreds and hundreds of pages of details of exact computations for every single little thing you can do, <laughs> they all ultimately say use whatever rules you want and don't use rules you don't want. Create yeah. a set of cons- uh, a set of consistent rules and play however you want to play. And I think a lot of people lose out on that too because you can play super structured math. You can play all the different kinds of methods of the game that yeah. you want to play. But it all doesn't these sound games- Fun. All of these games <laughs> say take what you want and use it, yeah. and don't play what don't do what you don't want to do. The goal is that you're supposed to have fun. I think what I do always with games or any of the things like that is I start off by the rules because then when I get familiar, then I start just going exactly whatever works. Yeah. That's the way I do. And and starting out with games and and there are there are games that are simpler. There are games that are more complex rules wise. Mm-hmm. And the best thing to do. Is just you know what I say. If you're interested in it, just you know jump into a game, but let them know I've never done this before, you know, so they can kind of ease you into it slowly. Well, that's the thing. A lot of game like tabletop gamers, they're not dicks like that. They're like, oh, you've never played? Well, what are you doing no, here? They'll be like, oh, no. come on in. They well, want to bring in a new. Person. These games are also largely cooperative, so there's yeah. that element yeah. too. It's beneficial to you when other people play well, <laughs> and, it, and it requires having you know, f- you know, uh, at least like four people. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing, like, especially the, the, and the older you get, having a group of people who can get together for several hours, either once or twice a week or once a month, gets harder and harder. Mm-hmm. So you have a tendency when you find people who are into it, you'd be like, hey, great, I'll get you into my game because then there's a better chance we can meet more often. Right. And I would say, and too, going back again, the, the your hardest thing, theatrical really. background and you still involved in everything. Yeah. Does that really add to it, the like appeal and just doing, you know. Uh, man, I've been running games with bunches of actors in them. Let me tell you, no, it's amazing. <laughs> it's it's no, very exciting, a very now. positive way. Yeah, it's you know, I I I think that um when you're you know with playing with actors is fun because they'll get a little bit more invested in their character and and uh, definitely and and that way you know they'll feel a little bit more. Uh, you know more kinship to the character, and they kind of you know they'll 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 interject parts of themselves, or they'll play with things that are you know. <clears throat> You'll 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 be a shy guy. You'll play someone who's very outgoing, or yeah. vice versa, or just to like do something. I will different. method act the shit out of this mage. Yeah, yeah exactly. There are, I think a tendency in the beginning when people start playing is to play characters they feel a little more comfortable with, and then as you keep on going, you say, "Oh, I'm gonna try to play something that's very different from myself," or "I'm gonna try this set of rules that I d- they ignored because I wasn't playing that kind of character." And it's a lot of fun to watch that happen too. To see people try a lot of different things, it's really exciting to work with people though, or to be playing with people in theater because the, a simple conversation can turn into this really interesting, funny, amusing, yeah. or serious. You might get material to write something to do. A- <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, I remember my friends, we went to England our senior year of college. We started having medieval banquets here every year. We had them for about 10 years just because we enjoyed the ones there. And I'm saying this because they would make us into characters. They always stuck me as a wizard. So I might want to... <laughs> you got to look, yeah. So I yeah, might want to try something else. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Yeah, Made it's like, in distress. I want to play... <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll play the big burly fighter. Well, I have my you know, Daenerys we'll Targaryen fixation or, right now. I'll be the, the sneaky thief guy who hides in the shadows and steals stuff. Or, um, but yeah, and it lends it, and it does lend itself well to audio mediums like podcasting because mm-hmm. the action is all in, you know, it's in the voice of the person running the game and the voices of the players. Mm-hmm. and uh, And you can kind of, you know intersperse rule stuff into it but just keep the talk i was gonna say that how important is the dungeon master then for having fun and having um the dungeon master is the most important thing (laughs) (laughs) in a way i mean there's you know obviously there's no game without players but at the same time in the format of role-playing games there's one person who's in charge of basically everything other than the individual characters yeah whatever originally called like a referee then judge and then the term dungeon master game master came out of it and essentially, they they are just they're the ones who know what's going on. 
And they're the ones that have to do the homework. I think that's the I idea. Was say, they, they, they have to go. write these. Well, at the very sometimes. least. At the very least, yeah. Even um, when you're running a game that's completely prepared ahead of time, you're still talking about hours of reading and pulling yeah. information and getting things organized. But people who, you know, our game masters tend to enjoy that type of... People find out right away if it's something they ever want to do or don't that, want to do. And that's the hardest thing. It's 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 easy to it's easier to find players, and it's, be, it's harder to find game masters. I was going to say, because they don't often play themselves. No. No, they don't. Do they? They do. As a matter of fact, Mario is... I uh... see it a very different way. I actually prefer it to being a player. <laughs> okay. yeah. I see it as the dungeon master, game master, whatever you're playing, depending on the game you're playing, is always playing. You're yeah. always playing. You're playing every single character that isn't being played by a person at the table, and you have all of these rules uh, and books okay. open and block. So it's it's constant. In fact, when I'm as a player, when I'm there, I almost have this sense of I'm like, okay, I'm waiting for my turn now. And that never happens when you're running the game because no, you're there's always... stuff happening constantly. Well, I... Things are falling off the tables that you have all around you. <laughs> you're grabbing at stuff. Someone does something you don't expect, and in your brain you're thinking, I've got 45 seconds to figure out how I'm going to turn this into what I thought it was going <sighs> to be or how to change it completely. And it's a whole series of no matter how much you prepare, this is also very interesting and theatrical about it, <laughs> no matter how much you prepare, uh, and to the players do this to, the, to a smaller amount as well, things are going to change. You walk in going, this is what we're going to do today, and then four hours later you go, what just happened? I have, I have detailed... <laughs> <laughs> this massive fortress full of full of hyena monsters, <laughs> and I have I have constructed the levels. I have built maps, and I've made little figures. Made so they all and uh, and then, and then the, uh, the yeah the sorcerer teleports everybody to the very top, and they fight the boss, <laughs> and it ends like instantly. Well, I think it would go back for to example. A bit of, I mean, your background as a director for theatrical work, I think you would. See y'all the whole picture and want to. <laughs> a lot of it is my teaching. Uh, so I've yeah. I spent two decades in a teaching career, and that's another big sure. part of it. Is I, I like to sit down with the books and go, okay, let's plan out how this is going to be thematically connected. Right, six months from now, there's a lot of that when you're running a game. Is really exciting to be thinking in about six months they're going to get to this encounter. And they're going to be so surprised when they find out what like, happened. Or you sons, of, you sons of bitches, you wait until August <laughs> and see what happens. Yeah, <laughs> really. Yeah. It's, wait, wait until the giant monster that I that's coming there's a lot you can play you can play just like one-off games a lot of that you mentioned call of cthulhu a lot of people get together here's a character play that character three hours from now you're going to survive or be insane or be dead and then you move on and play a separate game yes you have to understand call of cthulhu is the old lovecraftian thing where you don't but it's sanity points you lose yes so that's like just you can either take just being alive in the world or you can do it through a game. Yeah. But I loved reading that book. I admit I poured I still read the book just to read about the characters and everything. Yeah, it's it's the it's kind of the, almost the opposite of D and D where you could have a burly guy with all kinds of weapons and he can fight anything and it doesn't matter because the minute he sees a monster he goes totally insane <laughs> yeah. and gibbers in the corner for the rest of his life. And the know, thing is like, everybody's nasty in that game. There's maybe one that okay, this this elder god Maybe you get him on a good day, he's sort of apathetic to you, but he never really care. But most of them want to just suck you up and spit yeah, you out. it's it's uh, you know we 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 rule the universe, and then millions of years, then all of a sudden there were these little ants running around who think they run things, and we have to we have to deal with them now. So let's just you know your insignificance, your insignificance <laughs> to the elder gods. Yeah, yeah. Lovecraft had a massive inferiority complex. Yeah, he was. And he was a we'll racist. do a story on him. Oh yeah, oh yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. no, I don't believe that one. Kind of I'm surprised he, 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 he rolled. He rolled back on a lot of stuff. Oh yeah, he, did. he mellowed out. With yeah, the to be safe. But That's, yeah, there was. Yeah, there but was. I mean, let's not get into yeah, that. we'll do. We'll be a, for me. We'll do. We'll one do a Lovecraft like, episode sometime. On some of these Ooh, yeah. One thing I was surprised. Maybe I'm wrong that there's not any like superhero role playing games. There are. There had to be. I know. Yep. There, had um, to be. there are several actually, and and the, I think and like from a, from the from a gamer's from an inside kind of baseball standpoint of of why they're tough. Um, I ran one for a little while, and the issue that I had running it was that superheroes are purely reactive. Mm. They don't they don't start anything. You have to throw things at them. There's, you know, just like in in, in in comics, it's a whole different thing. But when you in a group of, with with players as superheroes, it just it's all reactive. The other thing too is that superpowers are hard to quantify in rules without them then becoming, you know, quantified like, rule sets. Disturbingly <laughs> OP. Like if you get like a Superman exactly. type character, mm. and then you know, you're like, in well, the Avengers, you have here comes have the asteroid. Four. I have laser eyes. Oh, that's 
goddamn convenient. Yeah, you have you have you know you have Thor on one end and you have you know Hawkeye. You know, yeah. <laughs> multiple, you have, multiple you have man. To, you, you have could, to provide the whole thing enemies for everyone. Or Batman was just patrolling the city at night, and nothing happens. Yeah, and then, and this I found with Super's games, they have a tendency to you have to kind of buy into a power level of the game. So, mm. is this superhero's game going to be street level, like you know Daredevil, the Punisher, or is this going to be like you know Gonzo level, Thor, Cosmic, yeah, you know the Hulk, Thor right. guys with ridiculous amounts. You know, and and there's and there's several games. There's Villains and Vigilantes. Uh, mutants and masterminds there's uh, a couple of different marvel superheroes games there's been a couple of different dc games um and so there's there's stuff out there and then there's a lot of uh setting agnostic systems where it's not based on anybody's ips and they make their own i played a lot of marvel game uh marvel game for quite a while this was pre uh marvel cinematic universe though so yes wasn't wasn't super cool yet so the italian red skull era <laughs> oh, yeah. if you've never seen yeah, that I've movie, seen that's, that movie. that's your it's, trivia it was what late 70s it was in yugoslavia no, it was, it too, was, uh, it was mid 80s mid 80s captain america and red skull the former german uh, yeah officer was italian Matt Salinger. Well, well both of the people that saw that movie appreciate your reference. Hey, you know yeah. what? It it to this day it still entertains me because nobody can deny it, it because it's there. Was it yeah. ever? I don't know if it was even ever officially theatrically released. Oh, that's I true. No, I think it was, no, I think it was a. Direct, I know there's a documentary video. about the Roger Corman Fantastic Four movie. There's a, there's a yeah, documentary that's one you, about you, it. Yeah, you can only get it as a bootleg because it was never. They yeah, they, they, never they just it. they they. It was a thing to secure rights. They had to make a movie to secure rights, so they just kind of puke this thing into existence and it's well because that's what they have to do what is it? every yeah. two or three years they have to do something or else they lose yeah. the rights to the character right. well we were talking disney about has no problem with that no <laughs> three to five minutes so. <laughs> Shh, don't Which... speak ill of the duck I, of hey the mouse. i i love disney yeah we all love disney i don't care yep sponsored i know by. i know i know that i know there's a lot that's of bad sponsored stuff by we disney, but god i wish I, was. I know there's a no, lot of bad not. stuff happening on a corporate level but as a as a as a marvel cinematic universe fanboy oh. i don't care right right <laughs> it's awful well, i i eat all of my my uh my 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 lefty anti-corporate uh rage and then on disney it's my it, that's my kryptonite well there's no like cliff eberhardt he's a folk singer i saw and it turned out that he did all he does a lot of the ads for Burger King. or He said, yes, I'm a folk singer, but I'm a folk singer who owns a house. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah, exactly. You know, yeah, it's, yeah. Principles, you know, are, principles are, can be expensive sometimes. I just think, we were just talking about the Marvel movies and the influence that maybe those those modern films that are, you know, of a certain uh, level of quality and, uh, and such have drawn people in and made, like, fans of, uh, you know, mainstream fans, I guess. Uh, besides just comic book readers of the past. But we talked about Tolkien and the whole idea of Lord of the Rings inspiring all these games. And obviously, you know, the Lord of the Rings trilogy of the early 2000s. Is that early 2000s? 2001? Yeah, one, yeah, one two, yeah, three. Because yeah. there was so, a big stink about the two towers because it just happened after 9-11. Yeah. So, I mean... But it's not like Tolkien for I know, it, but, but, you know, people have to have something to complain about. Yeah. yeah. But I think, but anyway, that's an example of like allegory. a huge. A, <laughs> Tolkien was you know, very big on saying they're not allegorical, even though they were totally allegorical. Right. Uh, uh, that's. <laughs> I mean, you know, people saw those Lord of the Rings movies that wouldn't necessarily read fantasy novels, and I think that that also is, a, you know, is an inspiration toward the type of things that were, you know, the, getting involved or interested in the kind of games that we're talking about. Well, then there's then there's then there's that that break that pop culture breakout stuff like Game of Thrones. Yeah. You know, it's like. You know, there's no, there's no, it's not a coincidence that D&D became popular again when Game of Thrones was a huge thing. I was going to say, isn't that weird? Yeah, yeah it, it's, and everybody's, you know, it, 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 yeah, and that was, and Lord of the Rings kind of pushed well, that up. I and, remember when the Lord of the Rings came out, I was like, Peter Jackson, it's like, the guy that did the Frighteners? Yeah. I was like, is the that guy the that same did, guy? The guy that, Meet the Feebles. The guy that yeah. did uh, 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 Brain Dead. Brain Dead. <laughs> new movie sounds With the really lawnmower scene. Oh, man. Got the... He's got a new oh, one out now, supposedly really interesting. Peter Jackson? Yeah, and I completely forgot the title. Well, I, 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 I don't know. know. That's that made King Kong boring. I don't know. Wow. Uh, I mean, look, like, I love the Lord of the Rings movies. I do. I, I, do, I, I had a friend, well. though, who fit that thing of... And the Frighteners. Great movie. I had yeah. a friend who really just fit that movies. thing of the person in the basement, though, because literally he got so... Do I want to see this because it's going to... Do I want to see it? Then he would, okay, they got this right. They didn't have this in. It's like, enjoy it for what it is, dude. 
Yeah, I got to. I, I, since it's adaptations, pretty high close. Yeah, it, once you once you really really understand what an adaptation is. Yeah, because how are you going to put on screen thirty five pages in a row of documenting the scenery as they walk through the woods? You don't it have doesn't to. Work. You can just show it. Right. <laughs> you know, it's but a visual just, medium, but, but there are other you, like you, you know, can't do it. You know, uh, then you break down the characters' motivations. Is is if you. In, you know, in my opinion, Aragorn in the movie versus Aragorn in the books. Aragorn in the movie is much more interesting because Aragorn oh, yeah. in the books is just like, yeah, I'm the king of Gondor. That's fine. He, <laughs> and in the movie, he's reluctant. A, re- a reluctant king is a lot more interesting than a guy who's just like, I'm just waiting for my moment to take my broken sword and. I was going to say though, his we might Step have aside, a down with him and his king. cousin about Magic Boring. the Gathering. You ever think of that? Yeah. Because the, those I know nothing about it, but those him and his cousin get into arguments about it all oh, the time. Oh well, I mean, yeah. magic is a. Uh, would you consider? I wouldn't really call that a tabletop game. It's no, more it's of not a, a game. game. It's a card game. game. I, yeah. I, I I have students who play pretty frequently, and I'm always saying things like, "Why don't you guys use your imagination? Play something cooler." And they're always <laughs> like, "Why don't you go read your books?" So I've never seen anyone actually like develop their wizard character, right? You no. know, How name their, I'm their, I'm their, I'm their, I'm their wizard character. I'm the master of white and blue magic, yeah. and I will shut I'm you not, down. I'm not going come to. We're yeah, talking I'm using the word cooler for these things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm no, not going I mean, to my Leon and war leader. It definitely yeah, contributes. It's definitely However, connected you can to it. now because well, there's an official D and D manual. For I always the world say this, and I use a term. Well, I use they're a owned term by the like same company. So. Drugs. <laughs> I use a term for like the, for me, the music of Nick Lowe took me over to a lot of different things. But I call some of these things like little gateway drugs to bring you into the bigger games because you yeah. start at this, and then you because I know I I'm always have an intellectual curiosity when I start something. It would take me okay. I tried this. I'm going to go on to this, and I'm going to go on to this. Well, why don't I make a proposition right here and now? Hey, hey now. I know I'm cute. Why don't we? <laughs> that's for later, Rob. That's Easy, all. That's off the shirt, dude. I know. <laughs> um, why don't we play once? You know, I was. You know, you that actually read my mind. So, I, oh, I have never. You can't play anymore. You can read minds. Don't let them play. Oh, it's, <laughs> I have never actually but played. I thought of actually. Never we were actually thinking of maybe doing either. some video. Yeah. Why don't I, we have a video of us playing? Yeah, I I am I am I'd down like, with that. I'd like Mario, to do we have plenty that? of extra dice, so you guys yeah. don't have to worry about that. Oh, tell us we about the dice material. Okay, so so yeah, so um, the dice are basically uh, you know, it, it takes it from being uh, just improv to it becoming a game. So all the dice really are is representing an, a random element. Um, when you you know basically saying. Boiling it all down, it's is your character tries to do something, and the dice dictate whether or not you do it, or whether or not or how successful you are in doing something. Um, so, uh, the multi sided dice. I honestly, I don't know the origin of the multi sided dice. Whether there was something that already existed in wargaming, probably. Or uh, um, it's actually something I, I thought about this morning. I was going to kind of look up, but I didn't. But um. And all that does we'll is for the video. it's the math. Uh, it just uh, and and there are people game. There are game designers who work out probability. I know there's some sports games like years ago they would have the multi side. Yeah, so. so I think they've been around for other kind of things. But it's just um, the different sided dice give you a different. Uh, uh, a chance of probability of of succeeding or failing. I was going to ask. Now this shows my night. night, night and they're all used day, different which ways. I can't even say the word, but. Can your characters die and you get a new one, or do they recover? I yeah. really don't know. That's what's um, all, it, there are there are very. F- I can't think of any role playing games where death is not a possibility. Um, the, and the, and that that's another thing that can vary game to game. Um, games with magic, uh, death early on is a is a huge threat, and later on in the game when. When you find the ability, there are people who are ability to bring you back from the dead. Uh, then death becomes kind of more of a minor inconvenience. But I think that that in and of itself is in the interest of if you you know if you've built a character from first to fourteenth level, it means you spend hours and hours and hours That's playing this and character. I, and you get by it. If the you first get hour. killed, <laughs> I've you heard get killed, stories then, of people giving up on it and never playing again because they lost their character I'm some just... people can get very attached yeah. um and that's right. you know that's it's like anything else there's some people some very, very extreme personalities and that's can, the problem can, I can make these things there's so tricky. many there's so many options of going back to yeah. the death thing do you play a science fiction game because does the character come back and they're like 
part, uh, you know, cyborg now, or yep. are you playing in a high level fantasy game where people routinely come back from the dead, or when they do, yes. is there a consequence for how that happens? Do they become, you know, that can also shape and change character. I mean, there's a lot you can do with it. Um, there are but, some hardcore players who yeah. are like, you die, you die, you, right. you, you call, you write up a new character. That was the original. A lot of the original D and D was like yeah, that, you right? You die, you die. The you goal was character. like, make to sure be nobody fair, survives. That's kind of how it should be. Well, <laughs> that's that's like I said. There's lots of play styles. Every 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 table. I, look at it, I call it. The, it's the, know, it's the, yeah. the 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 contract of the table. I look know. at it like this. I mean, when I was younger, I got really cynical about the world, and I thought that was you really know. easy about. It. But it was God. I hate this. People suck. Everything else. And you realize you can't let the actions of a few people and i think the yes. problem is mm. people always get like they'll have the person well we discovered dungeons and dragons and he was dressing it and then he went he lost it because his character died yeah. that's an extreme personality and i'm and, sorry for them but it's not I, every, and i don't you know. know if there's really any actual case of that happening no that's what we always say about the it's been dispelled you hear opinion. stories but you don't know anybody you don't know what they do they did. use because the they try to say okay like somebody it's a big did world something, i'm sure someone, oh, somebody, yeah, you know, cool. somebody did something unfortunately at the workplace or at school and did something horrible oh they dig up just because he yeah. might have played D and D red fantasy well, was... doesn't make him listen to heavy metal i yeah. i yeah I, I actually am not a killer i'm i kill people because i listen to 80s metal not because i play yeah, exactly. i knew Come it <laughs> uh, more more it's the slasher movies with me that's why i'm well, what gets me is because i was into uh, with some of the music i was into See, what we all I got our like, thing right. what i didn't like was people talking about it who didn't know one damn thing about it, but they had to find the boogeyman because right. you know, it was something it's, to it's blame so other than their shitty parenting. Or, you know? or, or in some cases, sometimes, you know, when you're blindsided by tragedy, you'll think all kinds of the, the Egbert kid. That was the whole satanic panic thing. Is right. this kid? They, you know, they, 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 all these, all these professionals came in and diagnosed this thing. Um, because it was an easy thing to do, and it got them. And and boy, howdy, were they on television a yeah. lot, and were they in newspapers a lot? They really well, made it. So and Osborne this kid album, had one time in clinical school. depression. He struggled with his yeah. sexuality. He struggled with making friends. He committed suicide. It was incredibly sad. And the worst thing about it was it was the goddamn board game. It was they blamed it on they they took no one took any responsibility. And blamed it all on this thing Maybe this kid was doing. Being and a little more accepting of people and letting them feel comfortable yeah. about who they are and saying and not having to hide and just be so scared. Yep. Well, if anybody find and yeah. there, if my mom knew this, she'd throw me out. So yeah. just accepting that, yeah. you. Yeah, and that and that and that's other things. Like things like role playing games and you know, and quote unquote nerdy nerd culture really like disenfranchise kids gravitate towards it because when it's a social outlet in a place that they don't feel comfortable around people you know and and it's and it's it's a subculture and subcultures are where the disenfranchised kind of go to well to... believe it or not i used to be shy when i was younger. <laughs> i don't believe it but now i found it's but i really was like then i didn't feel but when you find people even like at the comic store who dug what you dug you found where you sort of belonged yeah, and then you learned how to talk, and you learned that women women wouldn't kill you if you just said hi to them. Like, you're crazy. yeah. I actually also yeah. want to bring up that the idea for for anybody that's not aware, you know, it's not just people are playing these games all over the world, and so these groups of people that get together to play these games are just not all like. It's not just a table of fifteen-year-old white boys, no. right? I mean, yeah. I know that scene in Stranger Sometimes Things. Sometimes it's a table but of forty-year-old like, white men. That was the eighties. <laughs> That's true, or or maybe no. the ones talking about it. Yeah, are, are. well, yeah. Never but, knew, like the Demo- what? Well, really what let us white men explain it to you, people. I mean, it's def- it's certainly um, has expanded clearly, yeah. uh, but I, I'm saying that there's it, depending on the type of game that you play and the, and and the the. Uh, um, the style, the, you know, the, the the actual game itself, plus the style of game that you play, plus just the people, you know, there are people who are yeah. playing, you know, if you think they're interested in playing this and saying, well, I don't fit into that. I mean, they're like all kinds of people are playing these games oh, yeah. at this point in time. And it's opened up. I, I've seen expand. I mean, I've always been uh, I played a lot in college. And such, and so we had a pretty, I've always had a pretty diverse group when it came, uh, to, you know, pretty diverse group playing the games. But, I mean, I've seen a, a real change as far as, like, who's involved. And that comes from a lot of people going to cons and yeah. the internet connecting people and all of these other th- things. So, I mean, it really is a lot more diverse and expansive than uh, some people might lead it, you to believe. It also promotes, I, I think it promotes a culture of respect. 
um, which is what all this, all the argument, you know, arguments that people have about diversity or inclusiveness all mm -hmm. comes down to just, it's a culture of respect is what it is. It's just, hey, cool, we're all here. We're all doing this thing together because that's the thing we all like to do. And I think we can sum everything up in three words. Don't be mean. Don't be mean. Just yeah. don't be mean. Be kind. Don't be mean. I mean, don't be mean. The other thing I would say is one of the things we hope to do on this show is if you listen to this, and hopefully you do, and you've never done this before, maybe you want to try it a little bit. Maybe yeah, it might not be your thing. It might be your thing, but give it a try. And there are resources. I mean, hell, we're going to try it at some point, apparently, now. Yeah, we are. We're yeah, absolutely going to assign is, me a character. This is going to happen. We'll and, figure it out. We'll figure yeah. it out. No, no, we will sometime. We'll find a place and we'll get it yeah. on tape and everything. Yeah, because like I said, I've You'll never see, we're not going to come wearing funny costumes. No, no, no. no. Very low like key. my normal delicious Very low self. key. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, yeah, you don't, you know. But that's what we try to do. We have, Whenever we have anybody on there, try everything. You may like it. Yeah. It never hurts you to do different things. There's tons of resources. It might. <laughs> Depending on well, what we you're don't, doing. Yeah, okay, might. within reason, but we don't do any of that stuff. Yeah. And when I used to, when I was younger, it was a simpler time, so it was okay. <laughs> that's his <laughs> go-to. But as we wrap it up, stay tuned for details on when we're actually going to do some But as we all hear, yeah. thank you guys very much. And then well, you're you welcome back. And now, Mario, Mario's you want to do some yeah, plug Mario, for some of your stuff? I just, so, obviously, I'm involved in a lot of community theater. Um, right now, There's uh, I'm in rehearsals um, with a wonderful group of actors. Uh, to do a, a pretty funny a show that's very different from a group I, I typically do things with uh, a community theater group I run called uh, Dream Visualize Create or DVC. It's very uh, focuses on a lot of social issues and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, and that's where most of my attention goes to. But right now I'm actually directing a show for screenplays and uh, their idea is that they're older golden age on the stage type of uh, features. And so anyway, we're doing a piece that's actually very modern for them. Um, it's by Peter Schaefer. It's called Black Comedy. It was written in the 80s. And it is a one-act uh, farce uh, that really um, has a lot of fun focusing on uh, um, playing with uh, these uh, concepts of these characters um, all trapped in this room together and a series of crazy unfortunate events happen. And the whole idea is that it's a black comedy because... Uh, the lights go out very frequently, and so we see the characters um, try to struggle through all of the various conflicts they're going through uh, on this one particular night in real time um, when the lights keep going on and off and they're plunged into complete darkness. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of mistaken identity. There's a lot of people crashing into pieces of furniture. Uh, there's a lot of people revealing things to people not knowing that they're saying them while there are other people in the room. So it, it's a pretty amusing piece. Like I said, it's a very different piece than... The, uh, but I, I directed it actually about 12 years ago at my high school, and so I was really excited to return to do it again. It is running uh, in it's May. It's late May, late May. It's May, late, yeah. Because I have it written on my calendar. Yep. Down. It's, I think, the last week of May, like the right. 23rd, so 24th, 24th. Yeah, if, you don't, if you're not going Atlantic. away There's for gonna the be links holiday below. weekend, yeah. then uh, we'll make sure we check it out. It's, it's, a, it's a, a fun piece. And I like to always say, for, I've been following DBC for years, as you mm -hmm. know, and seeing, I just really like seeing the young talent and seeing these kids do this and get into it. And the things you always do always pull something out of left field it's awesome uh, my goal from the beginning was don't do anything that people perhaps have seen before or expect or take something well, if i've seen it before because you've done one that come again when you've done it again so yeah we did have an interesting oh, yeah. revival last year yeah um, <laughs> you want to you, can you say what's coming down the i mean so there DVC? are so dbc season begins in july when you're doing another show in december and so um and i have friends who may be involved in it we have a collection of dbc is always about high school students college age students and um on and performers local actors artists from the community and so we have a a, a collection of those people coming together and uh, we're doing a show in july it's the end of july um that's really exciting it's a it's a musical piece uh, that is, uh, well, the storyline has been written, uh, put together by me, but all of the music is by uh, um, British uh, pop superstar Robbie Williams. Uh, <laughs> so it's pretty exciting. Um, and then all the way in December, we're going to totally uh, dis, uh, disincorporate, disengage. Dis we're going to take so Romeo and Juliet <laughs> and really mix it all big up into this crazy blender and uh, set it in Russia. So it's going to be a lot of fun. The music like, shows are really cool because in the past you've done Springsteen, Vanessa Carlton, yeah. My Chemical Romance yep. for the Dre. And they're really neat how you incorporate them into a story. and It's something really to see. Thank you. Appreciate Coming that. Coming soon in the 2021 season, 
Dungeons yeah. and Dragons. Support the your, local, support uh, your local theater. There is a there is a play called She Kills Monsters that we've been yeah, kicking around for a while. Yeah. Oh, there you go. It's it's, it's a very theater D and D. Well, yes. Very cool, guys. Thanks for coming thanks in, and we'll, we'll set up well, an actual D and D time because well, I actually do, do want to try it. Great. Yeah. I'm excited. While. Thanks a lot. Doug. So thank it's you, about, and uh, we're not we'll playing let... any music, but if you want to listen to some fantasy stuff in your house, you have it. Put it on. Yeah, put it on, and have a good one.